Morning everybody and welcome to church this morning on this Wednesday morning. Just start with reading uh, from one of my favourite verses from Romans chapter 12. Therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to you, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Let's pray. Loving God, we, we come to worship you, but we worship you not just in this time, but we worship you at all times. We pray that as we see you in our time of devotion, in our time of observing things around us, that we will be moved, transformed, our minds will be renewed so that we will come to understand what your will is for us. Lord, speak to us through your word, speak to us through your voice, speak to us through the wisdom of other people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I thought I'd share with you something today, and some of you may remember there was a, a song that John Lennon brought out some years ago, Imagine There's No Heaven, It's Easy If You Try, No Religion. And he pictured that if we had no religion, what a... Uh, a wonderful world of brotherhood it would be. And Philip Yancey reflects on this theme and he said, um, just imagine that you, for the sake of a convenient label, I come up with a mythical society with the backwards, backwards spelt Achimerans, in other words, Americans back to front. And this is what he says, Achimerans valued youth above all else. Since for them nothing exists beyond life on earth, youth represents hope. As a result, nothing preserving the illusion of youthfulness flourishes. Sport is a national obsession. Magazine covers present a wrinkle-free faces and gorgeous bodies. Naturally, Achimerans do not value old age, for elderly people offer are a distasteful reminder of the end of life. A Kimran, for the Kimrans, the health industry promotes, um, promotes cures for baldness, skin creams, cosmetic surgery, and other elaborate means to mask the effects of ageing, to preclude to pre the prelude to death. In especially callous parts of Kimra, citizens often confine the elderly to their own housing, isolated from the general populace. A Kimra emphasises image rather than substance. Such practices as dieting, exercise, bodybuilding, for example, have attained the status of pagan worship rites. A well-formed body visibly demonstrates achievement in this world, whereas nebulous inequalities like compassion, self-sacrifice, humility merit little praise. As an unfortunate side effect, a disabled or disfigured pe person has great difficulty competing in a, a chimera. A Kimmeran religion focuses exclusively on how one fares in the here and now, for there is no reward if system after death. Those of Kimmeran still believe in a deity that looks for God's approval in terms of good health and prosperity on earth. At one time, a Kimmeran priest pursued what they called evangelism, but now they devote most of their energy to improving the welfare of fellow citizens. A Kimmeran spend billions of dollars on elderly bodies to support on life support system while they permit, even encourage, the abortion of fetuses. This is not a paradoxical as it seems, for Achimerans believe that human life begins at birth and ends at death. Just thinking about such a society gives me the creeps. I'm glad I live in the good old US of A, whereas George Gallup assures us the vast majority of the population believe in an afterlife. I've read that because our theme today is following the world or following Jesus. And I'm going to ask uh, Ben if he would come and read the, uh, the reading for today. Thank you, Russell. It's uh, great to be here with you today and um, you guys as well. Today I'll be reading from Matthew 22, 15 to 22. Paying the imperial tax to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Her Herodines. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? 
But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They bought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. And this is the word of the Lord for this week. And yeah, get Russell back to hear his message. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. I was just reflecting last uh, Christmas, as Christmas is coming up shortly, as I went down to the shopping centres, I noticed a few things that are different or getting less. Jesus seems to be precluded more and more from the marketplace. You know, we don't want to have images of Jesus because it affects, it offends people and uh, people are, are upset by it. And so Jesus has been replaced in the marketplace by Santa. It's okay to have Santa there, but not Jesus. Jesus' place is in the church and Santa's place is in the marketplace. But sadly, I find that sometimes Santa tries to find his way in the church. And so we often have theologies that reflect you better be good or something will happen. Uh, if you want the best presents, it, you've got to have a lot of money because the rich people get the best presents at Christmas. And I thought about that and I found myself coming back to Jesus talking about give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God's what is God's. But what is Caesar's? What does belong to Caesar and what belongs to God? It's interesting that parts of the Christian faith and people are not aware of this, remain in the workforce. If we look and we scratch the surface, we find that universities, schools, hospitals, trade unions, all of those things had their origins in the Christian faith. And yet many in the secular world don't realise that. And so the Christian faith has been like salt, encroaching the world and giving it flavour. But how does the world encroach on the Christian faith? And I, I found my answer on TV. I watched one day and it says on Channel 7, if you want to know what's going on in the world, watch our news. So I watched their news. And guess what I found? I found a number of things. First of all, I found drama. I found that uh, there were many stories about how some person had murdered someone or something had done something terrible to someone else. And I found myself reflecting on that and thinking, what does that tell me as I watch it? I watch these terrible people <laughs> as they uh, do terrible things to other people and what it does, it makes me feel good because I look down on them and I say, oh, look at those terrible people. And so I find that the attitude of the world in watching the news comes through where I find myself comparing with other people and often with people who are more sinful than I am so that I look better than I am. So there was drama. There were politics on the news. And uh, what can I say about politics? Politicians seem to be able to have this wonderful way of speaking and not answering questions and bringing things down to everything that is to their advantage. We often criticise our politicians for lacking authenticity and there's always some um, ultimate or ulterior motive for what they do. It's interesting that two groups came to Jesus. They were the Herodians and the Pharisees. The Pharisees, we know, followed the Jewish law and, and the Jewish faith. The Herodians were the exact opposite. As the name occurs, they were, they were followers of Herod, who was a, a puppet of the Roman uh, establishment. So what we've got here is two groups a bit like the Labor Party and the Liberal Party or the Democrats and the Republicans, one, two groups that, don't, that are opposite to each other coming together because they have a common enemy. And what do they use? They use flattery. Jesus, we know that you are someone sent from God. They're politicians. And there's doublespeak there because they don't really sincerely believe that about Jesus. But they're buttering him up. I'm so glad we don't have politics in church. <laughs> but we do. And we have politics outside. And I found myself challenged recently on the way I vote. We have elections coming up 
and I think, all right, what makes me vote the way I do? Now, I do swing a bit, but I have a preference for a particular party. But do I vote because that person is in the party, or do I decide which one of the, par the people I'm voting for, which one has the, fa the, the attributes that most likely are attributes of followers of Jesus Christ? And I found my, my mind thinking that I've gone away from the political party thing to look at that. What I'm frightened about is that sometimes people base their faith on their politics instead of their politics on their faith. And that's what I found I was doing. But the world had encroached on me in such a way that I was voting a party even though sometimes their beliefs seemed to go against the Christian faith. There's sport on the, on the news, isn't there? There's always sport. And uh, the thing about sport is there's winners and losers. Everybody loves a winner. <laughs> Everybody loves a performance. If a team's not performing, we sack the coach. If a player's not performing, we drop him from the team. And there seems to be that attitude coming through in a lot of the world's attitudes on TV, MasterChef, Australia's Got Talent, The Block. All we have to do is think about some of those things and what we finish up with is a winner at the end. And that's great for the winner, but there are losers. But in Jesus' economy, it's not about winners and losers. In fact, Jesus sided with the losers. In fact, in some people's eyes, Jesus was a loser because he finished up on a cross as a criminal. But what he did was he found victory through loss. And many of the paradoxical truths have come through Jesus, that we have freedom through surrender that we gain through losing, that life is found, true life is found in dying to self. And so the, the values that Jesus portrays sometimes go contrary to the values we uphold in sport and some of those values that sneak into church where we find ourselves comparing ourselves to the church down the road. So we make ourselves look a winner or a loser, or if we're a loser, we make a reason why we're not. It's interesting in the news too, there is a, a money section, isn't there? There's a, a section that comes on about money. And Jesus spoke a lot about money. And we speak a lot about money in church meetings. I've been in many church meetings where we've pondered for a long time over the problems of money, yet we haven't, problem, pro, pro, haven't, haven't pondered on souls. Isn't it amazing? I've been in one church where they're worried about the interest rate they were getting on their money. And then they said, oh... Our numbers in the church haven't increased in the last three months. And I thought, what's more important? What's more important? Money is important, but is it important at the expense of people? And the final thing on the news is the weather. <laughs> and the weather brings us, reminds us that we're not always in control. Even the weatherman gets it wrong sometimes. He uses all his scientific background and evidence, but sometimes he says it's going to rain and it doesn't rain. Sometimes he says a cyclone will hit your town and it goes somewhere else. And that brings to me the idea that we've placed a lot of value in science, but science doesn't always get it right, even though it sometimes proclaims it does. I just read a New Scientist magazine, and in the editorial, the editor says this about evolution. Evolution was challenged by what he called the pseudoscientists and quacks. But he, he concludes by saying, evolution won in the end because evolution is truth and truth will always win out. And my, I always love the way scientists, or not scientists, many scientists deny the existence of God and yet they're obsessed. Is there life on other planets? Now, I'm not denying that those things are important. I love my sport. Politics I find amusing. Uh, it, it, it entertains me. Money is essential. And I have a passion for science and I was a science teacher. But those things are secondary to what is God's. And Satan is a master of subtlety where he can draw us away from worshipping God and thinking we're worshipping God to worshipping the things that are really of the world. I read a book some time ago called Mission Drift. And it talked about some of the universities, the, the, the big universities, Cambridge, Yale, Harvard. They were all established by the Christian faith. 
They were all established. Yale and Harvard were established as training grounds for theologians. And they've deteriorated now into secular um, buildings, which shun Christian ethics. The YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, was set up as a Bible study for young boys who were homeless. But you know, they've taken the word C out of it because they've recognised that they're not Christian anymore. Child sponsorship groups are finding that they are being backed or there are big companies that want to back them and offer them lots of money on the condition that they get rid of the God bit. And some have succumbed to that. There are two that I know of, Compassion and, Front and uh, World Vision, that have not. And Mission Drift says if you're not careful, the world's values will come in and consume those which you think are Christian. I had a phone call the other day from Frontier Services, a lady who was ringing on behalf of Frontier Services. And I said, look, well, I already give to Frontier Services through the Uniting Church. Oh, she said, the Uniting Church has a lot to do with Frontier Services, doesn't it? They, they give it a lot of... She did not realise that it was a Uniting Church organisation. She thought it was a secular organisation that good old Uniting Church was helping out. But let's get back to the coin. Jesus said, whose image is on that coin? And the image was Tiberius Caesar. Now, Tiberius Caesar, that was offensive to many of the Jews to have an image on the coin because they did not believe we should worship any image. That went against the commandments. But what was more offensive was they had the image underneath. It was written, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. So if you took the coin... They were proclaiming him as a god. But Jesus is saying, that's Caesar's image and we have obligations to Caesar. We, we have obligations to our government. They build roads, they make, give us free hospitals, many things. We, have, we are really a lucky country in what we've received from the government. Jesus says, that is Caesar's image. And we should acknowledge what is Caesar's. But you know, there is another image. That's you and me. We were made in the image of God. And so we belong to God. And while we have a, an obligation to the world, our main obligation is to Jesus Christ and to follow him as children of the living God created in his image. Let's pray. Loving God, sometimes we get drawn up in the world's things and we can be busy, busy doing things that we think are for God. But Lord, we ask that you would just set us aside to think at times, are we doing things for the right reason? Are we giving to the world what really we're obligated to give to the world? Are we giving to you what we're obligated to you and lord we pray that we would know and have discernment to recognize what is yours and what is truly god's we pray this in jesus name and now may god's grace mercy and peace be with each of you now and forevermore amen <laughs>